Hey everyone, I'm Adam Harrington. I'm hanging out here in the misty winter woods with one fungus on my mind. This is a fungus with a magical quality of mysteriously appearing here in North America only about a decade ago. And this fungus is known simply as the Asian beauty. Because of its recent and cryptic arrival, some people consider this fungus to be invasive. So what exactly is this Asian beauty fungus and what do we know about its recent arrival here in North America? Well, that's the topic of this video. So if you're interested in learning more about this strange and perplexing organism known as the Asian beauty, come take a walk with me. And we'll see if we can find it. Okay, so this log is covered by several different species of fungi. The Asian beauties here, there's a lot of other fungi as well. Some of them are actually more conspicuous than the Asian beauty. Like this one right here. This is the violet tooth polypore, Trichaptum biform. There's actually an old cluster brick cat mushrooms down here. Behind me, there's an artist conch just forming. And there's a couple other species. There's Sterium australia, the false turkey tail. This is a fallen oak tree. It's been down for some time, so it's no surprise that there are a lot of fungi colonizing this log. But the star of the show today is the Asian beauty. So which one's the Asian beauty? Well, it's all of this down here, this crust fungus that's spreading across this fallen oak tree. And this one, if you look in the mycological literature, you will see that the Asian beauty is known as a hidnaceous fungus. So what's hidnaceous mean? Well, it's just a fancy way of saying it's a toothed fungus. So it has teeth or spines that hang downward. And more specifically, the spores are produced on these spines or these teeth that project downward. They don't go up like you would see in maybe some coral fungi, but they point downwards. Now the spines of the Asian beauty are whitish when young or creamy colored when young. Then as this fungus matures, it turns yellowish, then dried specimens will be brown. And each spine is about 10 millimeters in length. Now the size of individual fruiting bodies can certainly vary. Some of them are really, really small. So of course, when they're younger specimens like this one right here, it's only about an inch in width. But if you look at an entire cluster like this right here, this is maybe eight to 12 inches in width. And if you look from a distance, it might seem like the Asian beauty is literally covering an entire log. Hence why this is called a crust fungus because of its ability to spread out in that effused manner. Now the texture of this is quite waxy. And if you look in the mycological literature, there's a fancy word for that, serratious. If you look at a description, you'll see that's described as having a serratious fruiting body. Again, that just means that it's waxy. Now up until this point, we haven't used any scientific binomials to describe this fungus. We've been calling it the Asian beauty, but a lot of people who are interested in mycology want to know the exact species name of this fungus, the genus and the species name. So what is this thing called? Well, the most currently accepted scientific name seems to be Radulomyces copalandia. And I say seems to be because there's some debate as to what this fungus should be called. It's been called a lot of things over the years. I believe originally it was called Hydnum copalandii, and Hydnum is the genus of hedgehog mushrooms. It was also called Radulodon copalandii, and a lot of people are still calling it Radulodon copalandii. But based on microscopic features, and based on a paper published in 2001, it seems that Radulomyces is the most currently accepted name of this fungus. And if it is Radulomyces, then that means that this fungus is placed in the order Agaricales and the family Terulaceae. And we don't hear a lot about that family Terulaceae. It's a diverse but under-researched family of fungi comprised of mostly tropical species with coral-like fruiting bodies. Now I want to briefly talk about the spores of Radulomyces copalandii because they are abundant and they're really cool to look at under a microscope. So if you harvest fresh specimens, they will deposit spores for days. And I recently harvested a few specimens, brought them home to analyze under a microscope. And to do that, I took spore prints directly on microscope slides. I covered the fruiting bodies with a piece of pottery to keep the humidity levels high so that the mushrooms wouldn't dry out easily. And as you can see here, the spores are white. And if you want to take an even closer look at the spores, you could put them under a microscope. So here I'm using a compound microscope with a few different objectives. And after putting the slide on the stage, 
I'll start with the smallest objective, which is 4x. But because the ocular lens is 10 times magnification, 4 times 10 is 40x magnification. So that's what you're looking at here. Spores at 40 times magnification. And you can see just how many there are. If we take it a step further, we could use the 10x objective. So 10 times 10 is 100 times magnification, which is what you're looking at here. And now you're starting to see some of the details of the spores. If we take it one step further, we can use the 40x objective and 40 times 10 is 400 times magnification. Here we can really see the shapes of the spores, which in the mycological literature is reported as subglobos. That's just a fancy way of saying that the spores are almost round. And each spore is incredibly tiny with dimensions around seven by six micrometers each. And just to show you how tiny that really is, one micrometer equals one one thousandth of a millimeter or one ten thousandth of a centimeter. Another way to say it is that there are one thousand micrometers in a millimeter or ten thousand micrometers in a centimeter. So these spores are really, really tiny. And if you have a microscope at home, I encourage you to look at mushroom spores under the scope, not just because this is one way to arrive at a positive ID, but because microscopic features can be really beautiful and neat to look at. Now, Radulomyces copalandia is almost always reported on broadleaf hardwood trees and rarely on conifer trees. Personally, I've only seen it growing on dead trees. I've never seen it on living trees and never on barkless trees, like completely barkless trees. And this fungus is a white rot saprotrophic species that's very good at degrading the lignin in wood. And as a result of its actions, the wood, the resulting wood, has a white appearance due to the remaining cellulose. Now let's talk for a moment about the history of Radulomyces copalandia here in North America because the story is really interesting and a bit mysterious. It seems that prior to 2009, there were no official records of this fungus growing here in North America or anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. This fungus had only been previously reported to grow in Asia. But in 2009, this fungus was collected here in the United States in Massachusetts by a mycologist named Lawrence Millman. And since then, this fungus has been collected by a lot of people in many parts of North America, with most sightings in Eastern North America. So if this fungus had only been reported in Asia up until 2009, how did it get here to North America? And how long has it been here? Did it just show up in 2009 or was it here before 2009 and no one noticed? And if Radulomyces copalandia is native to Asia and it recently showed up to North America, are there any negative consequences associated with its presence on this continent? Well, the answer to all those questions is we don't really know. We're not exactly sure how this fungus got here. We're not exactly sure how long this fungus has been in North America. And if it is indeed a new import, we're not exactly sure if there are any negative consequences associated with its presence on this continent. But there are some theories floating around. Some people suggest that Radulomyces copalandii has been present in North America for a long, long time, decades, even centuries, but we've always called it something else. Another thought, which is probably the leading thought behind the mystery of Radulomyces copalandii, is that it is native to Asia. It showed up somehow in North America recently, and this fungus is extremely aggressive. It's spreading westward at a rapid rate, and it's potentially invasive. And as a result, Radulomyces copalandii could be displacing native fungal decomposers. Now there's not much more we could say definitively without resorting to speculation, but if we turn our attention towards the general topic of invasive fungi into the even broader topic of invasion ecology, perhaps we'll discover some answers regarding the mystery behind the Asian beauty fungus. So let's go do that. So invasive species, as you probably know, are non-native species with high rates of colonization that cause undesirable ecological or economic impacts, like this Japanese barberry plant. The reason that many people despise invasive species is that they're known to threaten the biodiversity of native species. 
and to disrupt the normal functioning of ecosystems. And I'm putting normal in quotations. So it's no surprise that invasive species are certainly a primary concern in conservation efforts around the world. But keep in mind that in a large number of these cases, invasive species invade new ecosystems, not because they're evil or because they're out to get us, but because globalization and international trade brought them to new locations. And of course, we have humans to thank for that. Now, when you hear the term invasive species, I'll bet you immediately think of a plant or an animal, but not a mushroom. Most people, even ecologists, don't necessarily think of fungi as being invasive or consider them to be among the top invaders in ecosystems worldwide. Case in point, if we take a look at global invasive species databases, fungi are poorly represented in these lists. Now, most of the time when fungi are mentioned in the context of invasion ecology, you'll hear about the effects of invasive plants and animals on native fungi. So fungi as victims of invasion, not as invaders, but as victims of invasion. But what about fungi as invaders? What do we know about that? Fortunately, we do know some things and what we do know about invasive fungi perhaps could help us determine what role, if any, Radulomyces copolandii may play here in North America if indeed it is a new arrival. Now, probably the most notorious of the invasive fungi are very conspicuous because of the effects they inflict within native ecosystems. So now we're talking about invasive pathogenic fungi the ones that originate in one part of the world, they're brought to another part of the world, then they wreak havoc on native species, particularly plants, trees, and animals. Now, most of these fungal pathogens were introduced unintentionally along with their host plants sometimes centuries ago by explorers and settlers who brought with them seeds and plants from their home countries. And of course, horticultural trading practices over the past couple of centuries have been responsible for the spread of invasive pathogenic fungi. And I'm sure you can name a few or would recognize a few just based on what they've done within native ecosystems. For example, here in North America, we are familiar with chestnut blight on our native chestnut trees, butternut canker on our native butternut trees, white pine blister rust on our native five-needled pine trees, and Dutch elm disease on our American elms, just to name a few all of which were caused in part by a fungus that was not native to North America. And right here is an American elm tree that's no longer living because perhaps the fungal pathogen that's responsible for Dutch elm disease has already gotten to it. But fortunately, I guess, we're seeing some edible mushrooms fruiting from this tree. Flamulina volutipes, the enoki mushroom, choice edible mushroom in my opinion, is fruiting from this dead tree. So usually when you see dead American elm trees, at least where I see them here in Western Pennsylvania, not too long after, you see the enoki mushrooms fruiting from them. But all over Pennsylvania, we rarely see older, more mature American elm trees because of this disease. We see plenty of younger American elm trees that seem to be doing all right, but not many older, living, healthy trees. So just to summarize the past couple of seconds, when we're talking about invasive pathogenic fungi, clearly we're talking about invaders that have negative consequences in their newly introduced ecosystems. But could invasive fungi have beneficial impacts in their introduced ecosystems? Well, they could potentially if we're talking about introduced mycorrhizal fungi, the ones that form mutualistic symbioses with plants and trees. Now, it might be more difficult to think of examples of invasive mycorrhizal fungi because their effects on ecosystems don't seem to be too conspicuous or detrimental. But many ecologists have been studying the topic of invasive mycorrhizal fungi for decades. Now, one reason that mycorrhizal fungi can spread so easily around the globe is that when non-native tree plantations are established, the associated fungi become established in these new areas as well. A good example of this would be when conifer plantations are set up. Many conifer trees are ectomycorrhizal, and they cannot thrive in introduced ranges without compatible fungi. And when you introduce pines or spruces or firs to a particular area, you're also introducing the associated fungi to this new area via their mycelia or spores. And once a tree and its associated mycorrhizal fungi are introduced to a new habitat, the fungi not only grow within the plantations, but they can also spread to nearby forests 
and establish relationships with native plant species. An example of this would be Amanita muscaria, also known as the fly agaric mushroom. This fungus is considered to be invasive in the South American country of Colombia. Amanita muscaria first appeared in introduced tree plantations in Colombia in the 1960s. Today, so 60 years later, Amanita muscaria is associating not only with the introduced trees, but also with a native tree species, the Colombian oak tree, Quercus humboldtii. Another example of an invasive ectomycorrhizal fungus is the death cap mushroom, Amanita phylloides. This deadly mushroom is said to be native to Europe, and it can now be found in South America and in many parts of North America, including the northeastern United States, in the state of Washington, in British Columbia, and in the coastal live oak woodlands of California. Now it's unclear whether there are any negative consequences associated with the introduction of Amanita muscaria and Amanita phylloides to new locations other than the spread of an extremely lethal amatoxin-containing mushroom in the case of Amanita phylloides. But both Amanita muscaria and Amanita phylloides are ectomycorrhizal mushrooms, meaning their ecological roles involve helping their host trees acquire minerals and other nutrients, and that seems like a good thing. But some ecologists worry that because these ectomycorrhizal fungi capture a significant portion of resources, these invasive Amanita mushrooms could displace by making resources unavailable to native fungi, especially the ones that are rare or threatened. So now that we have a general understanding of what some people call invasive fungi, and we covered some of the myriad effects that these fungi can cause in their introduced ecosystems, let's go back to Radulomyces copolandii, the Asian beauty fungus, and continue our discussion. We've already discussed the issue that we don't really know if this fungus is non-native to North America. It was first documented here in 2009 by the mycologist Lawrence Millman, though whether it was here before then and called something else, or it did indeed arrive about a decade ago, isn't entirely clear. But if Radulomyces copolandii did arrive here in 2009, is it invasive? Meaning, is it likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health? Well, taking a cue from invasion ecology, we see that invasive pathogenic fungi that infect living plants, trees, and animals can cause significant damage. We see that introduced mycorrhizal fungi aren't known to cause significant damage and may actually benefit invaded ecosystems. But we don't know a whole lot about invasive saprotrophic fungi, the ones that decompose woody material and organic debris. So it's too soon to say anything too conclusive about the effects good, bad, or neutral, associated with the introduction of the Asian beauty fungus, Radulomyces copolandii, here in North America. Personally, I'm not so sure we have too many things to worry about, but who really knows? Certainly not me. Thanks so much for watching this video. I truly appreciate it and I encourage you to get out and look for this really interesting and mysterious hidnaceous and serratious fungus known as the Asian beauty Radulomyces copolandii. If you enjoyed this video and you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, I encourage you to do that. You could also head on over to learnyourland.com, sign up for the email newsletter, we can stay in touch that way. You could also follow me on social media on Facebook and Instagram at learnyourland. Thanks again. I'll see you on the next video.